My name is Peter Poole. We have a small NGO called Local Earth Observation. It's based in Amsterdam. Peter, you've, been in, you've conducted a number of worldwide assessments on participatory mapping in developing countries where good practices is the most advanced, and why? Okay, first of all, we, the survey that I did was, was slightly different from participatory GIS. It was what, what we called community mapping. And we didn't use GIS. The idea was to make, to enable communities to make their own map. To that end, the people that I talked to are communities that needed to make a map in order to settle tenure issues. And we decided to, rather than uh, go in there and talk to them and uh, record them in this sort of normal participatory process and make a map for them, we actually taught them to make their own maps. And uh, that was very interesting because, so what we had to do we say what is the most simple, the most cheap technology that could be localized, could be used by communities. And we did about uh, eight or nine mapping projects in the Guyana Shield in South America. And after a while, a certain methodology evolved whereby we had community-based teams who used GPS, not GIS, <coughs> to gather data. And that was geographically accurate data. And then in the beginning, I or we would do the final map bit, you know, turn that information from the field mapping teams into a final map. And in a couple of cases, they went so well that we were able to equip the associations, you know, the, the indigenous associations, with their own mapping unit. And that was simply a, a computer, a printer, and the usual peripherals. And uh, they made their own maps without GIS. They, need, they used um, graphics, graphics, graphics software, because that's, what, that's all you need to make a tenure map. You don't need the complexity of GIS. And uh, it's something that the communities could handle themselves. So as a result of these projects, we had community-based teams who could gather very accurate field data quite independently by themselves in the community lands. And then there were association-based units, in a couple of cases, who displaced me and just took over the final part of the mapping process. So between the communities and the associations, they were able to control the whole mapping process, and it had a very inspiring effect on them. And They didn't need people like me anymore. Yes, it was very successful, and, 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 and I, I know a lot about North and South America, and I spent, so I spent quite a bit of time in Southeast Asia and Russia and India and after a while we got a pretty good idea of, of where where this kind of mapping and this included participatory GIS was most intensive and successful in the world and that was the Philippines. Yeah. So out of all these experiences what do you think uh, Africa as a continent in as far as development is concerned can benefit or gain from? Uh, I think there's a lot to be gained um, but because our or well, these mapping projects originated in a kind of classical tenure situation. In America, it's like post-Columbus. You know, you've been occupying our lands, we want to reclaim them, we're going to rename them, remap them, and reclaim them. And this is very common throughout America because it's all about 500 years since Columbus. And, uh, but in, 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 in the Philippines, it's different. And in Africa, it's even more different. And the kind of the, the whole situation regarding tenure in Africa is so complex and so subtle and it changes so much between communities that it's not so easy to go in there and s the tenure mapping that worked in Americas, the Americas would work there. And I'm not so experienced in Africa, uh, so I can't really, really, I really don't know. However, I do think that uh, I've been doing this for some years and I would say about four or five years ago there were very few mapping projects of any kind going on in Africa, let alone this particular community mapping approach, community controlled mapping approach that we developed. But it's been moving very, very fast since then. And this, I have probably learned more in this one conference about what's going on in Africa than I've learned in the last five years. It's very inspiring. Having gained so much experience in Suriname and Guyana, what major lessons have you learned in that context? I would say that the, there are probably three. The first one is that uh, you can do this. It is possible for communities and their associations or whoever operates a mapping unit which is indigenous controlled to control the whole mapping process. So that was the first <coughs> lesson that uh, it is possible to do it and, and these communities and their associations have demonstrated that. I would say the second lesson is that in f 
if I had a choice, and this is my own personal take, and is that I think it probably makes more sense if you are going to proceed to a mapping unit to have it independent within a country, uh, simply because if very often if you're with an ethnic association, and this happened in Venezuela actually with the with the Aquana, it sort of belongs to the Aquana, and it other ethnic groups within the country may not have such equal access to it. And in in Amerindia, in um, Guyana, there hasn't been too much of a problem, but um, the, 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 the political pressures upon that organization were such they weren't really able to spend as much time they wanted on, on mapping. In Suriname, it's a similar situation, except there, there are not just Amerindian communities who are mapping their lands, but there are also Maroons, Salamaca and Juco mainly of African descent, and they're not always in agreement with each other about where their boundaries are and so forth. And a couple of years ago, when I was doing the last project there, and, uh, someone came up and said, we need a mapping unit here. Uh, this was an Amerindian guy, actually. He said, we need a mapping unit here, which caters to everybody. It isn't like regarded as the property of the Alcuna or the property of the Salamaca. And that's... I would say in, 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 that's a good lesson. It, if it's independent, it's going to be more useful to be able to serve the interests of a greater variety of communities. And the third one is that um, what we did, we elected to teach people to make their own maps rather than um, rely on some outside agency, whoever it was and however supportive they were, to make the final maps. And, but having done that, having, we sort of have a responsibility to make provisions for afterwards, because these tenure maps that was in, uh, about all these projects were about tenure, they make the tenure map. It's taken off into negotiations. Sometimes in Washington, if they're suing, you know, they're using in international uh, conventions. Sometimes in the nation's capital. But whatever is the effect is that the community teams, which learned to make the maps themselves, had nowhere to go. And I had had some dis conversations with my colleagues about this, and I said, you know, we really ought to having elected to teach them and they wanted to, to learn to make some provision so that they could, um, after the mapping, upgrade, diversify their skills because during the mapping process, during the training, which takes about six or eight weeks, there's a continual discourse that goes through the, the map making process in the communities. The, they say, you know, we'd like to do forestry. How do we do that? We want to do. We want to control the impact assessment of these logging, of the logging, of the mining companies. How do we do that? So there's a real. It inspires a real strong thirst to do more. But we haven't taken that step to to enable them. We've sort of. When I say we, I'm I, I'm talking with the organisations that hire me to do these profit because they are lawyers, anthropologists, and they get into negotiations and they're not technical. Well, we in in actually in Suriname. We have proceeded some way. I was able to get some, um, actually, money from National Geographic to go back to the Salamaca territory after they had finished their tenure map, which is a really good map. And the reason why they wanted to make a map in the first place was because of this uh, Chinese logging company, Ji Shen, that moved into their lands from the north, and that inspired the project. And uh, but and, they, and, and the map has gone into the organization, organization of American states. Human Rights Tribunal, which is in Washington and in Costa Rica. So once again, the, the, the map disappeared. It went into somewhere else. And the Salamaca have had, there's no sort of uh, context for them to continue. But we were able to do something. And uh, this grant from the National Geographic enabled me to do aerial photography with the communities about this whole area of, that was affected by the logging. And they did the groundwork and I, produ I provided them with aerial photographs that they could relate with. Mm -hmm. And having done that, we then photographed the deep south of their territory where they want to develop their own resource management plan so they can take on other claimants to the area, such as conservation organizations and so forth. So we're sort of inching forward, but it's, it's, it needs, it's something that needs a little more attention than I can give, you know, more and more sort of resources than I have at my disposal.